There's the sound. Okay. 36 or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's 222 that signed up for the quizzes, so. They're up. Turn them oh, not, not till the end of the class. Yeah, but I'll take two questions for me after the deadline. So if you care about the grade, there is a schedule. Let me uh, mute these guys. Um, so I did make a schedule. So for the people that are planning to get college credit for this, um, then your grade would actually matter when in some future semester you can actually edit. So there is a schedule here and the quizzes are due on various times, but nothing is uh, considered late until after 2.10, I think. But after that, they're due every week or so, and if you're late, I'll take two points off. Of course, if you're not getting college credit, then you do it whenever you like. I did make all the quizzes end at the end of the semester so I can assign final grades, but then my plan is I'll just open it forever so people can continue to go through it. But I need to have a cutoff so I can assign grades for the people that are really going to end up getting college credit. It would be good to mention about null bytes. Oh, yes, that's a good point. We'll get there. The forbidden characters are coming up. Good point. Okay. Uh, of course, if you have a null byte, it will terminate the string, and we're going to have trouble with that in a future project, although I don't think we're going there today. So I want to just demonstrate project two. What we just did is enough. Let me check my slides. I think we've been through all this stuff. Yeah. All right. So project two here is doing something very much like this. And I'm just going to demonstrate it so we can talk about it. So here you are. This is going to show you what we do. Write simple code, compile, debug. Here's the registers we care about, ESP, EBP, and EIP. We know how to look at the stack. We know how to use Python to do attacks. That's all we're going to do. This is still exploitation without shellcode. I'm going to use the code that's already there, which is very limiting, but that is one way to start. We'll do shellcode in the next project. That'll be next week. So. The first thing is get rid of ASLR. I think I've already got rid of it, but we don't need that headache. So this gets rid of it. Now I make a vulnerable program. This is why I like to be able to copy and paste. So this is going to be nano, I'll call it demo2, dot C. Okay, there's my code. Now all I did was I wrote a main routine that calls a subroutine. And then it goes in the subroutine, asks for a password, and gets something without a bound. And then I just did some random bit flipping here. So it doesn't just say if password equals Fred. It's not incredibly obvious from looking at the source code what the right password is. So this is a little game where you have to get the right password. And the point is, you could go through the logic and figure out what the right password is by doing these bit flips. And I have one student do that. But what we're going to do is exploit it with a buffer overflow. And the point is, if you return a value that is not zero, the returning one, then you fail. If this returns zero, that means you were able to make this calculation turn into 48, and then you win. And our goal is to win with a buffer overflow. This is the kind of code you would use, for example, to defeat a product key. Where it needs some product key, you just need to figure out how to jump past that product key stuff. I used to do this back in the days of Commodore 64. You load a game, it would ask for the product key, I would just go on the disk, find the bytes that ask for the product key, just put knobs in, and now I got a game with no product key. So, you know, this is again, very simple attacks that work against really old code or really sloppily written code. So that's the game here. So I want to compile this thing the same old way with the uh, dash no pi and all there, dash no pi and dash static. So I called it demo two. And I'm gonna call it demo two. That should do it. Okay, now by the way, I've been skipping past it, but we are getting warnings. All, we're doing horrible things you shouldn't do, of course. This is the original buffer overflow. Everybody found out about it a decade and a half ago, two decades ago. So of course your compiler will warn you. You shouldn't be doing this nonsense, like getting something without a limit on the size of it. But it doesn't stop you, it just warns you. So now I run this thing, demo two. It asks me for a password, and when I put in the wrong password, it says fail. So I want to find the magic password that will say win. And you can do it because of the buffer overflow. So I run it with GNU debugger. 
Oh, then we do fuzzing to be logical, to follow our pattern. So now what happens if you put in a long password? And you get a segmentation fault. So this is good. Now this would mean either I filled up all the memory and hit the end of the memory segment, or I've corrupted a register so it tries to jump somewhere that's forbidden. And the second one is the exploitable one, and that, of course, is what happened here. So I want to run it in GDB in quiet mode, demo two. Now I just run it. Now I give it that long password again. And it crashes, and once again, it crashed at 41, 41, 41, 41. So some of these ended up in EIP. So this is a classic exploitable buffer overflow. So now to exploit it, I can list the program. 115 will do with an L. And I can see here's main, here's test password, here's the overflow. The overflow happens in that statement when it reads something in that's too big. So I want to examine the state of memory after the overflow, but before it hits the end and tries to return. So I'll just put a break here at line nine after it's done the input. So break at nine run, start over from the beginning. Now I put in these A's. Now it breaks. Now I can do info registers. And I can see that the stack frame goes from 600 to 628. Now I can do x20x ESP and 628 is here. So that's the situation. I have a bunch of A's, and then the A's went past it, so some of those A's ended up in EIP. So now I just have to feed in something less redundant. This is just like we've done before. So let's run it again and put in – see what that does? Um, examine the stack frame. EBP is 628. So 628 is here. So the 48s hit the EIP. This is the stack frame. That's the EIP. The last two characters in the H's hit it. So I'm very close. That's hitting the EIP. So I'm going to make one that targets it exactly. So I run it again. I put in that junk. And now I put in 1, 2, 3, 4. And if I've done it right, that'll hit the EIP. So now I... Uh, do info registers to make sure I know what I'm doing. It's ending at 628. So when I do an x20x ESP, 628 is here. And there it is, 1, 2, 3, 4. So now I have my exploit. That is my exploit. That will give me the EIP. Now I just have to figure out where to go to hit the EIP. So let's disassemble main and see how it works. Now, one way to understand this very, like I say, the easiest way to read assembly code is to not even look at anything, just look over here. This calls test password, this calls puts, and this calls puts. So it calls the subroutine, then it does some kind of test, and sometimes it prints this, and the other time it prints that. And in fact, it just follows the structure of the raw source code. So if I list one to 20, here is the um, routine I'm in. It um, prints something, then it does a get, and then it returns and prints one of these two things. Now, I'm only looking at main, so here it does one if. The first thing it prints is fail. The second thing it prints is win. So if it has preserved that order, I would want to execute this puts. Now, here's something important that we'll come to again and again. When you call a function, the first thing you do is put the parameters on the stack, and then you call it. So if I were to jump directly to this line, I would not print the right message. It would print some other message. This push is what puts the address of the text on the stack. So I have to, oh, by the way, I can even examine the memory there. Let's try that x, 4x, that memory that it's going to put on the stack. Okay, this is readable ASCII. That's a space. 59, 6F, 75. I think that's U space win. I think you can see characters with 10S. Yeah, U win. 
So that number is the address of the message you win. So if I want to print you win, I don't go here, I go here. That puts the message on the stack and then calls the routine that prints the message on the stack. So this is my target address right there. So I have the two pieces I need to make my exploit. I'm gonna just copy them here. Here's the address I need, and here's the attack code I need right there. Those are the two essential ingredients to make my exploit. Now I'm ready to make it. So, all I do is quit the debugger, and now nano uh, demo2a.py, for example. Demo2.py might do it, I don't know, some naming convention. So it's uh, shebang user bin env python, then print that junk, and now instead of one, two, three, four, I want this. I like to put it in my code somewhere. That's my target. So let's get rid of the colors. It's backslash x ed eight eight oh four. Oh, 08. That's this address backwards. That will presumably now print you win. Let's see if that works. Uh, Shamad plus X. Let's just run it. Okay, there it is printing the characters and some unprintable junk at the end. And so I want to run that into uh, my program, which I think I called demo2. And I win. So it jumps to the win, I win, and then it crashes because I damaged EBP. It can't really continue. Now I could have written a more careful exploit since I control that too. I could have put the right value of EBP there and then it would keep running because I wouldn't damage the program, but that's not necessary. I've now done the simplest attack where I got the winning message. I usually use user bin Python. Yeah, uh, the difference here actually, I think, is that user bin env Python will be the version of Python loaded on your machine. And use it in case it's loaded somewhere else. I think it doesn't really matter in most cases. But I think I saw this recommended as a more general, better procedure, so I tried to improve my habits. It's like using IP address show instead of IF config. And like using service Apache 2 restart instead of slash etc dot D slash Apache 2. There's the old way and there's the new way. And that's the new way. But in practical purposes, it's probably always the same. Yeah. Sir, the yeah. Python you're using is version, version 3 or? Uh, this is version 2. Everything I'm doing here is version 2.7. Um, version 3 is a little different. Like the print has to be in parentheses, I think. So you could use Python 3, but the code would be a little different. Good. These are good questions. So that's all you have to do, I think, in this project. You um, First, you show that it crashes with a long bin put. Then you debug it and get to where you can control the EIP. So you have, um, this is like a GGHH in it, controlled characters. And then you make it so it prints the you win message. That's all you do. But this is the heart of it. This means you understand the stack, you understand the input, you understand how to control EIP. Now, the only thing missing is shell code. So what we're going to do after this is have a longer exploit, like 400 characters, and then we have enough room to put the shell code in there too, where all those A's were, and then jump to that. And then we can start overcoming defenses, like you say, ASLR and so on. Then you have to upgrade your code. Now, if you want to practice, do project two, and when you're done with that, I made an extra credit one here to do a few more fun things. And I found, saw this about a couple of weeks ago on Twitter. Somebody put his black hat training materials from a couple of years ago available in GitHub. And I got them and it rocks. So after you're done doing project two, I do project three maybe, and then do project 10X. 10X, this is a new one. And this one uses return oriented program. It's really pretty easy. So this will work with ASLR turned on. And this is actually cool. There's something, a tiny version of Linux that's only 30 megs big. So he put his program in that. You download this, run it in a VM, you get a whole Linux machine, it's only 30 megs. And it tells you to open it in a web browser. When you do, you see some very terse instructions. And if you're really elite, you can do it from just these instructions. Because it's always the same procedure, but I gave you step-by-step -step instructions here. Fuzz it, 
And this one is actually an HTTP server. So you don't just send the data in in a command line. You have to make a connection and send the data with socket. This is, with, this is why Python is great. You can send an HTTP with just a couple lines of code. This opens a connection on port 80. This is how you send data over port 80 to send it to a web server. So there's a couple of new techniques, but it's really only a small step up from where you are. So you have to fuzz it and make it crash with a variable number of A's. It turns out that a thousand A's is enough to make it crash. Uh, in fact, I found that 180 A's is enough to make it crash. Maybe one where you can vary it. 100, it returns okay. 170 works, 180, it crashes and doesn't answer. So 180 is enough to make it crash. Then uh, you find the EIP, you take over the machine, and you search call code. So after project two to project three and 10X are the next steps forward. And we'll go through these in more detail in future classes. Any more questions? Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, you could, when I first tried to do buffer overflows, I just put the overflow right in main. The stack structure of main to return to the host is actually more complicated. So I think it can be done, but these simple techniques don't work. That held me up for like a year. Then I found Georgia Weedman's book that has an exact one to try, and I finally, that one worked. I finally got it. Before, I was very frustrated. I read the description. When I tried, it didn't work. And I said, there was a bunch of stuff I didn't know. There's like six or seven steps you really have to do. The other one someone already mentioned, when you finally insert shell code, you have to avoid bad characters. And every program has a different set of bad characters. So you have to test the characters first and find out which ones you can inject and which ones you can't. Some programs terminate strings with just zero, some spaces terminate it, tabs, character turns, line feeds, other characters, and you can't use any of them in your attack string. So you have to actually do a sort of tedious job of testing all the characters, or you will have attacks fail for no apparent reason. It's, it's, uh, there's really six or seven major steps to do an exploit, and if any one of them is wrong, it doesn't work. So that's why I wrote this course, because I was very frustrated for years. When I finally got it working, I said, I'm going to make it less painful, where you really have instructions that take you through every step. Because <laughs> all the books assume you know about half of it and tell you the other half, and then it doesn't work, and they say, well, what are you stupid? And I said, well, that's not good pedagogy. Yeah? So in this example, or at least examples, you've got the source code. Yeah, but you don't really need it. I didn't actually use it. Yeah, you could do it all just from the assembly language. The only thing I actually did with the source code was putting the breakpoints. Okay. And so if you want to, let's uh, GDB this thing again. You won't have the source code. You won't have the source Most code. likely, that's right. And you don't really need it. So if I go here, if I want to find the entry points, I just learned this today. I think it's info files. Um, yeah, this shows you the entry point, which I never knew about. So um, here's the local, here's the entry point of the code. So if I didn't even know the name of anything and there wasn't even something called main, I could still figure out where to start. But there is something called main, so I can disassemble main. And look at this. And now I can get the names of the subroutines. There's something called test PW. This is a library function. Now I can disassemble that. And now, if I want to do this, the only thing I have to do is find the overflow and put a breakpoint after it. And I can read it here. Here's a print. Here's the gets. That's the overflow. So I just want to break after that. So I could go here and break there at that address. So break star at that address. Now I can run, put in the stuff, break, and now info registers. The stack goes to 628, so I can X. Six twenty-eight is there, and see I used lowercase a's, which are 61. So you can see I can do it all. I don't really need the source code for this simple thing. It's just I wanted to make it easier for the first couple projects. You don't really need it. You'll have the source code if you compile with the minus G switch, but real commercial software and real viruses, of course, don't do that because they don't want to make it easy for you.
Yeah. Does the, okay. Does the, the program still have to crash and have that bug yet? Yes, it has to have a bug and you have to find a crash. That's why you typically fuzz it, and there are a whole bunch of fuzzers. We'll play with a few later. Um, the simplest fuzzing is what we're doing here. Just try really long inputs. Then there are others where you try deformed inputs and stuff, and there's various levels of smart fuzzers. And so what you do is you fuzz stuff. It takes a long time, like hours and days. Then you find crashes. Then you try to decide if the crashes are exploitable. And Microsoft actually provides a program, Exploitable, which is a debugger extension, to tell you if it's exploitable. Microsoft is like the king of all this because Microsoft suffered most from all this and they put in a lot of defenses and a lot of tools to help software developers find these problems and fix them before they ship code. So putting buffer overflows in commercial code is not common anymore. That's only about 5% of exploitable attacks for the last count. It used to be like 80%. And then it, everybody started wising up. Now it's dangling pointers. Those are harder to catch. But there's always something. Any others? See if I got any online. Ah, here comes some online questions. Use after free. Yeah, use after free is a dangling pointer. That's right. Where there is some kind of pointer you can write to or read from that is no longer in use. So I, just like we did when we read past the end of an array, I can now mess with memory that I shouldn't be able to mess with. So again, I can create memory corruption. And that's what we're doing. We're exploiting memory corruption. There was this nice structure of stack frames, and we broke it so that when it tried to use it, it had unexpected results. Yeah, all right, colon, colon, one at the end. Oh, that's something up there. Allows you to write in big ending. Oh, I don't know about that. That's interesting. Oh, oh no, this, yeah, this colon, colon, minus one, this is a Python um, command that will reverse the order of a string. So you could do that. You could write it in forward order and then put this, and that would reverse it in Python, but yeah, I'm not going there. But yeah, you certainly could, that's right. That would be a way to make it a little easier, I suppose. Good point, thank you. Wouldn't it be possible to just calculate it to the saved EIP instead of generating patterns? Um, if you had the source code or something, you could. You could try calculating it, but what happens is you typically have fuzzed the program, you don't have the source code, and you need to just, um, and you find, say, that something 500 characters long crashes it. Now, <coughs> you wanna keep the total length of the crashing input always the same because it might be that 500 crashes it and 600 crashes it at a different point. So you keep the 500 length the same and then you put in non-repeating code to find your EIP. You could calculate it in principle um, in simple cases, but usually you do it just experimentally because you really don't know how complicated it is and you don't really know quite what the code is around the crash. If you were to read the assembly code and figure it out, of course you could calculate it. If you had the source code, you could calculate it, but it's faster to just find it experimentally in most cases. Yeah? How do you inject something useful to jump into like your own code? That will get you next time, but it's the same process. You get some assembled shell code that does something like open a listening port, you stick it in the exploit as, as X, and you can get that code by writing your own assembler, which they cover in the book. In this class, we're gonna use uh, Metasploit, MSF Venom will generate shell code. And not only that, MSF Venom will generate shell code carefully avoiding bad characters. You can list which ones to avoid, which is super important because a bunch of characters ruin everything, like 0, 20, 10, 13. Uh, a bunch of them tend to break everything because they terminate the string and you don't get the exploit. So you have to generate code that dodges those characters. And Metasploit makes that easy. Yeah, another question. When you smash the stack with A, some values like EVP weren't smashed. That's a very good question, and I don't really know the answer. I remember there was a long list of 10s, and some of them are not 10. What it means is we put a 10 there, and later on, some other command put something else on top of the 10. Because we ran over the uh, reserved areas, and some other part of the program wrote on top of it. You'll see that, too, in real exploits. Um, and here's another fun fact, since people are asking these questions. If you have Metasploit shell code, you have to have a 16 or 32 bit NOP sled around it because Metasploit shell code actually expands when it runs into neighboring RAM a little bit. So if you have like just 100 bytes and you put in 100 bytes of shell code, it will crash and die on you. That, I couldn't believe it when I found that out. It's, it's rude. There's a bunch of little gotchas that are nowhere in instructions that get in the way. Anyway, there's Big Ending, and he's got another Python package. Yeah. Uh, is this chat going to be for YouTube? 
well, I think it will be on the YouTube. Yeah, this should show. I think the group chat shows on the screen. I hope so. It's a good question. I don't know if it's recording or not. I guess we'll find out. It doesn't. Oh, how rude. Okay, if you don't see it, then, then I will see if I can save it somehow. Uh, I can save the chat. Okay, good. Let me save the chat. Show in Finder. And um, see if I can post it on the screen. Meeting save chat. There we are. So I can now open it with a text editor. And there's the chat. Oh, boy. So uh, there's not that much of it. Oops, something bad happened. That's not what I wanted. Um, I was hoping to just make it visible on the screen. It doesn't seem to be right. Yeah, that's good. That's working. Let me just make it a little smaller. And there. Now it will appear in the YouTube video. This is a very good point. If it was long, I might save it as a separate file, but I think in this case it's probably good enough to just leave it on the screen for a little while. People can pause the video here if they want to read that. This is what we were talking about in chat. This, um, you could write it forwards and put this colon colon minus one stuff at the end, that would reverse the order. So you wouldn't, that's one option. And uh, the other thing that came up here, there's a pack to reverse the order. That's the main thing I saw here. There's a couple of Python tricks. Good. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the Zoom. I'll go upstairs and help anybody who wants to work here. You should do your homework and email them in. All right. Uh, end would be somewhere. Here's end. All right.